My name is Hina Ahmed. I'm a fourth year medical student at the University of Central Florida College of Medicine. I've enjoyed writing since I was very young. When I started medical school, I asked myself, how could creative expression help me be a better physician? I discovered the field of narrative medicine and wondered, what did it have to offer to the medical school curriculum? What could I learn about empathy and the art of storytelling, and how would that affect the patient-physician relationship? Today I'm going to introduce you to a narrative medicine expert so you can hear about her experiences. Dr. Rita Sharon is a professor of medicine and the founder of the program in narrative medicine at Columbia University. She attended Harvard Medical School and completed her residency in internal medicine at the residency program in social medicine at the Montefiore Medical Center. She completed a doctorate in English from Columbia University. She currently directs the narrative medicine curriculum for Columbia Medical School and became director of the Virginia Apgar Academy, a community of educators at Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons. As of January 1, 2018, Dr. Sharon is also the inaugural chair of the Department of Medical Humanities and Ethics at Columbia Medical School. Well, hello, Dr. Sharon. How are you doing? Good. Happy to be with you, Hina. Thank you so much for doing this. I know you're very busy and you took some time out of your schedule to speak with us. Yeah, but it's a chance to reach people who are so important to reach. I mean, residents and medical students, New England Journal, so what could be a more important audience? Yeah, thank you so much. So I guess we first want to talk about what narrative medicine really is, and I feel like getting a definition from a narrative medicine expert like you would be so great. So could you please talk about that? Sure, sure. And I, I will talk about how it started which mm -hmm. is a way to know what it is. When, when we define it now, we, we have a one sentence definition. Narrative medicine is a clinical practice fortified by powerful skills in listening, in understanding, in interpreting, in absorbing the accounts of illness that we hear in our work. So right from the beginning, it centers on how is it that the clinician, the physician in our case, can not just hear what patients say that point to a particular disease, but really that fully embraces what it is that patients convey, that they express about being ill, about being close to death, about suffering, or about fear of all those things. So, so again, the, the, the one sentence definition is it's a clinical practice, it's a medicine that can be accomplished with really sophisticated skills in receiving and knowing what to do with the stories of illness that people tell us. All that right? Really powerful stuff. At the same time, very simple and very complicated. Right. Yeah, definitely. So you said how it started. Can you talk about that and how it comes into the definition? Sure. And I have to say that the field itself was born at Columbia. We started the whole field. Mm -hmm. And it was because Columbia, and it's not true of many institutions, um, the medical school is not disconnected from the rest of the campus. So when I was an assistant professor in medicine and doing shifts in the emergency room and clinic practice in Presbyterian Hospital, it was possible for me to go to the English department and begin to take courses. Oh, okay. I just knew there was like medical humanities already. There was some literature and medicine. Remember, I mean, there's still a journal. It was already existing at the time. So I said, I, I just want to take a course in English. I was a pre-med bio major. I never, I never really studied literary theory, but I read all the time. So mm -hmm. I said, can I take a course? You know? And they said, don't take a course, take a master. See, the English department really wanted to have a doctor studying with them because mm -hmm. they knew that we knew something very complicated about narrative theory and practice. Huh. So they let me in and it was a revolution. Hina, it was a revolution. Right. In how I thought about and did my internal medicine practice. So within months of starting, and I was, I was like, I got to study with the amazing international experts, you know, right. Wolf. I mean, this was Columbia. So as soon as I started knowing something about what happens between the reader and the writer, or in our case, the teller, the patient and the listener, uh, it's not just a exchange of data. It's a deep, deep, dicey, risky contact 
between one who tells and one who receives. And what literally the story that emerges is made by both of them, is co-created by the teller and the listener. We, we know this. You don't have a conversation that could be replaced with um, paragraphs on a PowerPoint. Right. Because it depends what the other person says. Mm -hmm. okay, three. See what I mean? So it's not, and the medical students listening will know what I'm talking about immediately. It's not the same as communication skills. It's not like a little script that you use to get through a, a review of systems. Right. Instead, it's a very deep personal presence as a listener, as a receiver, as a witness, as a patient is struggling to put into words what he or she is going through. And I find it interesting that you say it's a deep presence because do you still feel like that's something that is taught or something that you learn through experience? Because you described it also as a skill. Yes. So it currently is not taught very effectively because we haven't really figured out that it's part of what we need to know. It's a little bit off to the margins. Okay. Uh, which is why it is so lucky for us that more and more medical schools and residencies are turning to the humanities, to the arts, to uh, ways of using creativity, Sometimes, and the residents will know again, uh, well, the residents this time will know what I'm talking about. When you hear about the resident wellness program, mm -hmm. sometimes what that means is, you know, you get to have a yoga lesson once a week. Sometimes it means you get to have some training in um, one minute meditation, like mindfulness. Oh, right. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes it means you get really deep training in 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 this in what it means to be um in a deep present relationship with one after another of sick and dying patients and how do you maintain your own sense of calling how do you not submit to despair how do you very literally get through the day without being enraged at everybody <laughs> because you're supposed to do in your duty hours what would take an ordinary human several days, right? Right. So all of that is called wellness, but I think one component of it is this, and the, the good programs have ways to do this. How do you, your own self, your own embodied self, become present with patients so that you're able to absorb what it is they're trying to tell you? Right. And so you ask, you know, is there, is there a way to do this? Is this a skill? We, we don't turn to communication studies. It's not exactly psychology. Instead, we have found, and I think the discovery that my Columbia group that I convened back in 2000 when we started narrative medicine, I convened people from the literature department, philosophy, creative writing, oral history. Do you see? Right. So it wasn't it wasn't organizational management instead it was the deep basic science in narratology of what happens when persons express what they themselves are going through yeah it makes a lot of sense and i, I think just like you said it's it seems like a very simple uh, concept but it's also very very complicated mm -hmm. um as far as the layers that you have to search within yourself to get to that present every single time. And I guess what I was going to ask was, it is a very broad kind of umbrella term. And how did you kind of place parameters on what is and isn't narrative medicine in order to teach this skill to other people? And that's been the work that we've been involved in for 17 years, mm -hmm. has been developing the conceptual framework, the philosophical foundations for the work, and then the methods. I, I'm not doing this because I'm uh, just involved in self-promotion, but right. one of the things we did in the past two years was to publish a textbook. There is a textbook. It's called The Principles and Practice of Narrative Medicine. And everybody on this call will remember that it was Osler who called it The Principles and Practice of Medicine in the late 1800s. So, so this is really the basis of the practice. 
And you're right, it far exceeds what's sometimes called narrative medicine, which is like, let's write about our patients. Right. And, and that's, that's certainly part of it. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the very act of representing what you see as a doctor, representing, and it's usually done in words, it can be done in, in, you know, painting or sculpting or dance. We're teaching our medical students dance and choreography as part of our uh, training. But, but you, have to, you have to, in some way, create something out of your perceptions in order to actually see it. Part of aesthetic theory, aesthetic philosophy. Uh, so that's why we write. Mm -hmm. We write in order to discover what we've seen. Definitely. I mean, I had already written poetry for a long time, but when I started medical school, I realized combining my patient experiences in words was definitely making my, my first two years of medical school where you're just reading textbooks just more meaningful for me. But I definitely was trying to explore other avenues to do that. And what I, exactly is narrative medicine? Because I didn't think it was just these poems that I was writing, which is right, what right. you talked No, about. but you, you just said it. Mm -hmm. it's, it is the act, and this is what takes skill. It's the act of representing, in your case, in words, mm -hmm. very complex events, situations, states of affairs. And that's what I learned as an early graduate student in English, that right. I'd come back to my practice in the clinic, and I would have a way to really comprehend what had just happened with that patient. And I got in the habit of writing very short, you know, descriptions of what went on in the office. And it was through the writing of it that I came to see what it was. And after, I was a little bit spooked about that at the beginning. How can I write something without knowing what it is I'm writing about? Right. I wasn't at that point a skilled writer, but I came to understand that that's how writers do their work. Right, that's the journey you go on whenever you start a right? new work. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as time went on, I would write things, but then I'd give it to the patient the next visit. And I'd say, this is what I think we did last Thursday. Will you, what did I leave out? So the patient would read it. Um, and, and, and I was stunned at the beginning. Um, several said to me, well, you know, I mean, they'd correct something. No, it wasn't February, it was April when I had the hysterectomy. And then they'd say, well, we left something out. Got that? We left something out. So this patient rereading what I'd written some weeks before, um, realized that there were dimensions of her experience as a patient, as a sick person, that had not been conveyed, that she had held back. And so then they would tell me, and it was usually about abuse or loss or death. Once I remember it was a miscarriage that had kind of not been grieved. Once it was a fire, a very big fire in, in a childhood home that had given her scars that I had asked her about and she had kind of brushed it off. And then she told me on the second time. Mm -hmm about about this um, early childhood trauma. Um, and others were, were uh, of course, sexual violence. So, so that helped me to see how, how controlled, how careful, how uh, cautious patients have learned to be when they're talking to their doctors and nurses. And we have to show that were trustworthy, I mean more than trustworthy, that were capable of holding, like in our hands, holding their report of suffering. Do you think that narrative medicine, kind of the solution to getting all of that in the first read, because you said that came out in the second read, so is that where you're moving towards? or N Not necessarily. Okay. I'm glad you asked that question because th there's, there's, there's another one hovering in the background, which is um, technology and AI and ways of shortening the kind of work that doctors have to do. 
So let's say there's a Watson in every office, okay. right? The IBM mm -hmm. giant brain. So that the doctor doesn't have to spend too much time figuring out what antibiotic to use, or do I need an MRI or a CT with contrast, or um, much bigger questions. You know, what's the possibility that this is a subarachnoid bleed? Um, so if Watson is in the room with me, I can depend on Watson to do that. And then I can depend on myself to do the parts that Watson can't do. And narrative medicine is the parts that Watson can't do. And so it's not, I, I, it's not really subjective as much as it is rigorously skilled in assembling all the perceptions and knowledges that one can gain from a patient. Okay. See? Almost like taking all these pieces of a person, putting it together. You, you become very absorptive. You take it all, right? It's what she says and what she looks like and the gestures and where do the silences come and when does she clench her fist and when do the tears come? And also, what mood do I find myself in? You, medical residents listening will know very, very well that they come to be able to diagnose certain conditions based on how they feel. So when you feel yanked around by a patient, you know that probably that patient is borderline. Right. And, and when you find yourself feeling uh, uh, um, deeply sad, I, I mean, all of these, everybody has their own glossary. Um, I find when I feel very like irritated, right. patient, it is a signal to me that there's some kind of somatizing going on. Okay. Do you see? So even our own emotional state becomes part of the data. Okay. Well, I think that's, that's really interesting. And the way you mentioned technology is also important because it's becoming um, more talked about, mm. um, get more advanced. Yeah, uh, I'm going to interrupt you to say, um, everyone always says, oh, but nobody has the time to do that kind of listening. Well, if Watson is in the, uh, is in the room, Watson will do some of the work, and I will have the time to do this kind of really singular personal deep listening. Right. Well, there could be other people, just as a counter argument, saying that maybe if, if we let Watson do too much, am I still going to be useful in that room? So I think that's kind of your answer to that, that if we work on these other skills, also we can build a little bit more of our own clinical expertise. Yes, because I mean, we know better and better, we know how um, the old kind of post-enlightenment positivist sense of what's a disease mm -hmm. is being um, superseded. And I mean, everybody knows that the organ systems don't work the way they, you know, it's not like the heart is the pump and the stomach is the, is, is the, 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 the food grinder. It's not no. that at all. It's not that simple, right? It's not that all. So, so indeed, the very nature of disease is being renegotiated because we're learning through genomic studies and precision medicine and all of the extraordinary science going on today, now, in the next two weeks. Extraordinary work going on, uh, discovering the uh, unthinkable complexity of, of messaging within the many systems, uh, the epigenetics, not just what's in the DNA, but it's what's making some of the R uh, mRNA uh, 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 generate itself. And what is it that's causing suddenly protein assembly to, 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 to be triggered? Well, it's not just what's in the genome. It's environmental, it's toxic, it's affective, it's, it's neuroendocrine. There are so many uh, forces way beyond the kind of Cartesian organ system, mind-body dualism. There are so many forces that now we know contribute to what we call disease, illness, ill health. So I think moving on that same line of thinking, do you feel that there is 
a way to incorporate that a little better into medical school curriculums today? And what are your thoughts on how we can do that better? There's a, a large foundation of conceptual knowledge. When we teach our master's students, we have a graduate program. They are reading uh, the philosophy of the subject. They're reading, the, which means, you know, what is personhood? Um, we teach a lot of phenomenology, which is the philosophical science of, uh, of embodiment. What does it mean to live in a body? How do we, as humans who live in bodies, take in and uh, integrate all of the sensory perceptions that we're open to? How does it work? to be a human in the real world. We teach our graduate students a great deal of really literary theory of how do stories work. And this is, this is what we have to know in order to really develop a useful, effective, dimensional understanding of what a patient is going through. So, so at Columbia, we have a four-year program. Uh, it's called the Foundations of Clinical Medicine. Uh, which is not unlike other doctor courses, doctoring courses. Um, but through the whole thing, the students are writing. Uh, we have a portfolio. They write in it, you know, um, every couple of weeks. Um, usually in, in class, in the small groups in this doctoring course, um, we'll bring them something to read. I mean, we do creative work with them. Uh, we bring a poem. We bring a paragraph out of a novel. We bring a painting. And by really talking about, by really examining very closely mm -hmm. um, this particular work, whatever it is, work of art, right. um, we look at it very carefully. What could this possibly mean? You know, and we really talk about it. And then after that, we invite the students to write in a very expanded way, not an essay question, but a, 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 a very kind of open-ended prompt that lets them really muse in writing about what we've just been talking about. Okay. And it leads, and they, they put this in a, a electronic portfolio and they hold on to this through their whole four years. And their small group preceptors who I've trained in doing this um, are able to read some of what they've written and, and through the reading of it, just through the reading of it, they can see some aspects of the deep complexity. So, so by the time they get to their third year, they look back on what they've written. I mean, we make them do this every semester. We ask them to look back on what they've written. And we say, what are you discovering about yourself just by reading your own writing? Mm -hmm. And we just published one article on it. We have another one in the works. Um, it's been very impressive to see the kinds of discoveries over time that, that come from this narrative work. So, so that's one part of the curriculum. We have a, a seminar series, uh, again, that's required um, in the first year, where students pick among many different seminars, but they got to do one. And one is on the philosophy of death, and one is on fiction writing. I mean, it's very wide, but it's all in the humanities and the arts. And then there's a lot of students, by now it's like 20% of the class, who elect to do a narrative medicine scholarly project at the end of their uh, uh, four years. So what I'm saying is there's kind of a required curriculum for everybody, mm -hmm. and then those who are particularly inspired and committed to this specialty, if you will, then they get to work uh, much more intensively. Right. That's really great. I just wanted to give the, the listeners a chance to hear a successful incorporation of these kinds of skills in, in a medical school right now or is currently doing that. I think a lot of people might shy away from really pushing for that to be incorporated in their, with their regular medical school lectures. And I think, oh, yeah. did you feel like you had any other people's opinions that you could discuss that maybe their perceptions on narrative medicine were different than yours? And how did you kind of reconcile that? Oh, you know, like any new field, mm -hmm. um, um, it, it takes a while for, for the whole, the whole uh, 
the movement to be in theory right to 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 be taken up so i mean we think it's great mm -hmm. that different programs different schools different countries are um are getting involved in this work uh we're, we're starting a, a, a pretty high level training program in paris for um clinicians and uh, uh scholars in narrative medicine we have a big program in lisbon we are starting something in istanbul um so it's really worldwide i'm going to doha qatar and beirut lebanon um, in the fall because in both of those places um want to know what is this narrative medicine and how can we start it so it's thrilling you can imagine right very exciting huh. <laughs> and and i mean there's there's lots of stuff in residency programs also which are very different from what we do with medical students they're very shorter and more tailored um kind of on the fly uh, but also some things that are experiments study in ways to let interns and residents do a more narrative narratively rich interview with patients i do want to ask um <clears throat> do you do you feel because I, I feel like we covered a lot of the benefits of narrative medicine and in incorporating this kind of thinking um, as a clinician but do you feel like there are any kinds of cons to approaching the subjective area in in the sciences well I, I think there are risks right okay you can word it that way too mm -hmm. there are risks if you do this work poorly okay so um this is very powerful work and and you know you meet with a group let's say a group of interns uh one of one of my junior colleagues has regular meetings with the interns when they're on ambulatory medicine block um, and uh, she's well trained. She's almost finished our master's program in narrative medicine. So she's well trained. Um, and she knows how to bring um, something, a text, a poem, or something to these uh, seminars and to really lead a conversation that goes deeply into what, they're, what the, the meaning of it is. And then to um, choose a writing exercise that lets the interns really delve into the, the topic. Okay. It's, not, it's not like, it's not trivial. So she knows how to do it. Um, because she's trained, uh, she's not gonna get in a situation either where people think this is a support group or a venting session, okay. complaining, complaining about the duty hours. Right which is often what these things turn into. See? Mm -hmm. So, so um, it, it, it takes some training to know how to really use the, um, the, the, um, the language, the text, the, the, what I've been calling them the representations. Right. So as to let the participants develop skills in perceiving themselves. Okay. So the risk is if it kind of degenerates into a crying session or a venting session, and um, that's not what you're there for. You're not a support group. Um, and you don't want somebody kind of unduly exposing very deep things about themselves, thinking that it is a support group. Right. Mm -hmm. See, that's where the risk comes in. Okay. And then do you have an example of a risk in a patient encounter, if it, it was done incorrectly, and how to be addressed. Well, the, these are risks that we all. It, it's not restricted to narrative medicine. Any any intern knows um, if 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 a question is asked uh, and and the the questioner is not quite prepared for the answer. You know, are you prepared to hear the answer? to a question you ask about suicide or about violence or about criminal activity or about harm to a child. See? Mm -hmm. And those skills are definitely, I, I see it now in medical school curriculums that they're really trying to make sure they carve out those tools for us mm -hmm. to use 
in those patient encounters so that we are prepared. Or to know that you're not prepared. <laughs> right, at least <laughs> one or the other. <laughs> That's true. Right. Well, I, I think uh, we covered a, a lot of the benefits and we definitely discussed the power of narrative medicine and proper storytelling, you know, using those tools correctly. Right. Uh, it's definitely very important. And it was just very fascinating to just hear you talk about it so passionately from an expert like yourself. I guess I just wanted to kind of close off with any advice you have for medical students, young doctors, uh, just general advice for young doctors who are listening right now. Well, you know, um, I'm just starting uh, next week a month-long elective for fourth-year medical students. Right. You have it in February. Mm -hmm. That's right. And it's a, it's a whole immersion in narrative medicine. So there's, uh, I think we have five this year. So I teach a contemporary fiction course and a psychoanalyst who happens to be the assistant dean of education teaches a kind of transference, counter-transference course where mm -hmm. students are able to write about complex, serious relationships that they had with patients over the course of their training. And a graduate of, of PNS, which is the medical school at Columbia, went through his internship in medicine at Presbyterian Hospital, and then followed his muse, and uh, because he's an artist and a graphic, a graphic artist, mm -hmm. and he's now a cartoonist on the staff of The New Yorker. Oh, wow. You look for Ben Schwartz. Okay. Like every other week, there's a cartoon by Ben Schwartz, and he's a doctor. And so he, he meets with the students to do graphic novel and they all, they all do kind of comic strips. That's great. And then I have a novelist who's teaching a fiction writing workshop. So they all of them um, workshop a short story. And then finally this year, this is, I'm trying this for the first year. I have a musician who's working with them in listening to scores like screenplay movies. Okay. okay. So that they can figure out something about how does the musician convey and display mood and suspense and tempo? It's, uh, we don't know what's gonna happen. <laughs> but music is like a non-verbal way of representing and conveying. So what the students say all the time at the end is, so I don't have to leave behind these things that I love to do. So that's the advice is you don't have to leave behind the things that you love to do, like reading or writing or composing or, or being a pianist or, um, you know, having a blog. Uh, these, these skills, these skills of imagination and creativity expand and strengthen what you're able to do as a doctor. They belong. They belong. That's the advice. Well, that's very powerful, and I'm sure it's going to inspire a lot of people to, to find some way to incorporate their passion yeah. and not leave it behind. Yeah. But I really want to thank you, Dr. Sharon, for taking the time to speak with us. Yeah, it's, it's been a really, pleasure. It's been really a fascinating conversation, so thank you very much. Okay. Good luck. Thank you.